das tavuros blineder tomorrow. I'll do it later today. Blineder tomorrow will start five or ten minutes in the shear. Now maybe we'll do a tumid a little shorter. We'll see. I'm going to do about ten minutes in the shear of <coughs> an Indian about living in Eretz Yisrael, the Hashivas of Eretz Yisrael, and that's because Rav Cook writes that when we're in the three weeks, people are, are focused on a lot of different things. We talked about this, I believe, in Pasha Shalach earlier, this, uh, this uh, several weeks ago. We focus a lot on the first base Hamikdash was destroyed because of Gili Araya, Shvitas, Dolim, and Avodah Zorah. And then we focus even more because we are at a loss for the second base Hamikdash. Chuvim base Hamikdash, Sheni Chomerlon. We spoke about that last week. The first base Hamikdash was the city of Yerushalayim was broken, was breached by the Babylonians on the ninth of Thomas. The city was breached by the Romans in the second day, Samikdash, on the 17th day of Tammuz. So why do we fast the 17th day and not the ninth day? So it says in the Shulchan Aruch, it was Purban Beis Hamikdash, Sheni Chomerlon. The Chorban of the second Beis Hamikdash is much more severe to us because the first Beis Hamikdash was a terrible destruction, but we got a second one. And what, what the exile that we're in is the exile of the second Beis Hamikdash. So it's Chomerlon. And when we talk about the second base Hamikdash, we talk about the second base Hamikdash was destroyed because of Sinas Chinam. And there's so much talked about during the three weeks. Sinas Chinam, we have to work on Sinas Chinam, we, we have to get rid of Sinas Chinam, we have to learn how to love Jews, etc. And that's a wonderful thing, that's very important. But we have to remember that the three weeks, which culminates in Tisha B'av, and Tisha B'av, both the first base Hamikdash and the second base Hamikdash were destroyed. And the reason they were destroyed on Tisha B'av is because of the Chet HaMaraglam. The Maraglam came back late in the afternoon of the 8th of Av, and the story is known. And on that night, the 9th of Av, Leil Tisha B'av, the Jewish people cried, we don't want to go to Eretz Yisrael. The Gemara in Tainus makes the Cheshben and the Afchof Tess, when the Maraglam was sent out, 40 days later they came back. It was Ches Av, and at night the Jewish people are crying, that's Machlekes, Ches Av, Ches Av, we're going to leave that. They came back for us on the eighth day of Av, they, the story proceeds, and the ninth night the Jewish people are in their tents screaming and crying, we're not going. And the Rabbana Shalom said to the Jewish people, Atem Bechisam Bechia Shalchinam, you cried for no reason. I want to bring you into a beautiful land, and you're crying. You're crying for nothing. If you want to cry on the ninth day of Av for no reason, in the future, there'll be many reasons to cry, unfortunately, on the ninth day of Av. And two of the five reasons we cry on the ninth day of Av is because the first base of English was destroyed, and the second base of English was destroyed. So the three weeks, which culminates in the in the in Tisha B'av, which is the Churban of the first base of English and the second base of English, are rooted in the very first event of Tisha B'av, which is the Chet HaMaragam Rosh Hashanah in Eretz Yisrael. Therefore, Rav Kook writes that it's very important during the three weeks that as much as we're going to concentrate on Ahavas Yisrael, we have to also remember that the root of the three weeks culminating in Tisha B'av is the Chet HaMaragam Lash and Hora on Eretz Yisrael. And that requires a tikkun during the three weeks to understand and learn about the beauty of Eretz Yisrael and talk about Eretz Yisrael in the most superb terms. And that's what we're going to try to do. Maybe for five, ten minutes a day, we'll pick a piece uh, from a Sefer that talks about the Hashivas of Eretz Yisrael as a tikkun for the Chet Hamaragun. All right, so we are in the Das Tavunos. We are, if you're following the pages, we're on page, I believe, 45 at the bottom. And if you're following the paragraphs, we're in paragraph 54. Rav Friedland, the page Mem Hay, 45 at the bottom. In the paragraph version, if you're using that English version, then we're in paragraph 54. 
And what Ramchal was teaching us was that right now, the world is running based upon two source supervisory powers of the Rebbe Shalola. One is Hanhagas HaMishpat, where there's good and evil in the world, and good is rewarded and bad is punished. But I don't see that happening consistently. And that's one of the reasons that the Sefer was written. One of the four kashas that the Neshama asked the Seichel at the beginning of the Sefer is, I believe in the 39 Imamins, and I understand nine. There are four I don't understand. And one of the four that the Neshama say doesn't understand is Skarva Onish, reward and punishment. Because if the good are supposed to be rewarded and the evil are supposed to be punished, it looks like the world is chaotic, anarchy, topsy-turvy. The bad guys are doing fine. The good guys ain't doing so good. So where do you see the Skarva Onish? Where do you see the Hashgacha? That's one of the kashas the Sefer is built to answer. But at any rate, there is good and evil in the world. And they are supposed to be reward and punishment in the world. And we don't see it the way we want to see it. So Amchal explained to us that that is one type of supervisory power, basic, two basic supervisory powers. The other supervisory power is Hanhogas Atov, or Hanhogas Hashlemus, or Hanhogas Hayichud. It's the supervisory power of the Bar Shalom where he's bringing the perfectly imperfect world that he created perfectly imperfect so that we can perfect it. He's helping us bring the world to a state of perfection, even through the imperfections. The imperfections, what we think is going haywire, what we think is chaos, what we think is going backwards, is actually being used by the Bar Shalom to move us forward. And that's the amuna we have to have that what the Rebbe Shalom is doing is he's running the world through the corona and through the riots and through everything, and it seems like it's chaos and it's anarchy. That's because we have narrow human vision, but all these things are going to be used for the Geula Shalom, have your mail. Moshe Rabbein was thrown into the Nile, and Haman building the stick for the Hag Mordechai, and Yosef being sold by his brothers so his dreams would never come true, and they caused the dreams to come true for full of a full that we went over. Every event that we would look at as human beings and say this is a step backwards, the Bar Shalom is using in the way to bring the Gula Shalom forward. But we need to understand the Ramchal. And, and the Meir Tashem, uh, when Mashiach comes, the Ramchal says later in the Sefer, the Bar Shalom will be poorly similar. They'll open the curtain so we're going to be able to see the past, present, and future. Right now, the curtain is very tightly closed. There's a little space in the curtain, and that space in the curtain allows us to see what's happening right now. And there's some space in the curtain that allows us to remember what happened in the past, but the curtain is quite narrow. When the curtain opens up completely, we're going to see the past, the present, and whatever future there still is to see. But we're going to see it all together in the way that a perfect puzzle comes together. And there's going to be a tremendous simcha for the person to be able to finally understand all of the history and how every part of the history was to make the Geula Shalema come. You remember Yosef at the end of Pasha's Vayechi, after Yaakov died, the brothers, the brothers came to Yosef and they were scared that Yosef would punish them. Yaakov Avinu, as long as he was alive, the Shabbatim were confident that Yosef would not take revenge against his brothers for selling them. After all, Yaakov is alive. The brothers feared that after Yaakov died, now that he died, that, Yaakov, that Yosef, with the power of a viceroy of Egypt, would take revenge against his brothers for selling them, for selling him. So Yosef said to his brothers, they came to him and they said, um, that Yaakov Avinu wants, a, Yaakov Avinu, our father, who has now passed away, told us to tell you that you shouldn't do anything bad to us for what we've done to you. Did Yaakov Avinu actually say that? Did he not say that? Learn Bashas Vayechi at the end. Vayomer Elo Aleim Yosef, Altivo. Yosef said to his brothers, Don't be scared, I'm not taking any revenge against you. Am I in the place of God? I'm not God. You had bad intentions. You wanted to sell me to make sure that you would never have to hear about my dreams again. 
You sold me to make sure that I would never be able to rule over you. You sold me to make sure you would never have to bow down to me. Guess what? You sold me and you bow down to me. Guess what? You sold me and you need me. Guess what? You sold me and I am the ruler. My dreams came true. Elohim chashova letoiva. God made it into the good. So while you, Yosef says, in that ultimate statement of what we would call the Gile HaYichud, Yosef HaTzadik says, you sold me, you were motivated to get rid of me. You were motivated so that I would never become a ruler. You were motivated so that you would never have to bow down to me. God took what you did and he turned it into exactly what he wanted it to be for the good. You did bow, you did sell me. But selling me caused you to bow down to me and caused me to be a ruler. So whatever we think is taking a back step because of our narrow vision, there comes a point where Yosef is able to say, yeah, you did this, but God turned this into good. We need to understand that when Mashiach, we're going to see the whole picture, we're still never going to understand the full depth of God's plan. We're going to still understand what God did as being part of a greater plan to bring about Ka'ula, but the depth of the, the plan we will never fully understand because to, to, to be able to understand that you need God ingenuity. And as we spoke about last week, even when the perfect, the perfectly imperfect Berea becomes perfect, it will be perfect on a human level. It's never going to be God. No one's ever going to be God. No one will ever be perfect like God. No one will ever be powerful like God. No one will ever be as smart as God. So no matter how smart God allows us to become, we're never going to be smart God. And therefore, we're never going to have the God understanding of all of the history of the world. We'll have a human understanding that will give us an understanding of how all the pieces fit together. Okay, bottom of page 45, However, you need to know, everything that Hashem does is awesome. It's wide and deep without any end. As we say in Mizmash Yom HaShavas, Kapitel Telem, how great are your deeds. The smallest thing that God does, the smallest thing that God does is so deep that man can't even understand it. She Never, even after Mashiach comes, we're never going to plumb the depths of the whole plan. And that's the meaning of the Pasuk in the same capital tale of Ms. Mashiach and Shabbos. How deep are your thoughts? Not only are your deeds great, but how deep thought through they are. So the smallest thing is thought through so deep that a human being will never comprehend the depths of God's plan. Turn to page Rambov. God's the way God runs the world right now, we don't understand at all. Mi'at Hashem, Lassad Lava, will understand it, will understand it on a human level. What we get to see is the superficial events. We get to see the corona, unfortunately. We get to see the riots, unfortunately. We get to see a world in a state of what we see as chaos, unfortunately. But that's a superficial view because that's a narrow human view. It's a shitchiyus. It's just narrow. It's just uh, superficial. The true purpose of these events are hiding beneath the surface. It's under the table, those battle caps that we talked about on top of the table, the magnet under the table. The true purpose of all these events are hidden from us. What's inside all these events are the same. All of them are going towards a good direction and they are not bringing about anything that's bad. They are not losses. They are not pushing the football back. And certainly this is not seen and this is not understood right now. In the future, 
at the very least, we will be able to see and understand Again, the Ramchal uses that same poetic term, Mesibos Tachulosa. It comes from a Pesach in Eov, that the world, Mesibos Tachulosa, Mishaper, the world will look like it's topsy-turvy, but God is really turning the gears in a direction he wants it to go. We should not imagine that what the Ramachal is saying, don't imagine what I'm saying to mean is in the future we're going to get such a perfect understanding of the history of the world and every event that we're going to understand it the way God understood it. We're going to get to the, we're going to get to the depths of this godly plan. Never going to happen. Anything that man can understand from God's acts, it's a drop in the large ocean. Yes, we'll get a greater understanding, but even that greater understanding that will make us feel like we understand world history from the beginning of time to the end of time, that'll be enough for the human being, but we need to understand that's a tipa min hayam it's a drop of water in the great ocean. We need to understand that as the world runs in that supervisory power known good and known as good and evil, God allows good to happen. God allows evil to happen. We need to understand that in there, no matter what's going on, the Rabbanu Shalom is bringing the imperfect world to a perfection. And this inside that's percolating and bubbling to bring about the Geula Shalema, even in events that we think are detrimental, Shanema, the Pasik says in Yeshaya chapter Laman Hey, Oz Tipa Kachna Ene Ivrim. And that day the eyes of the blind will become sighted. In other words, we're going to be able to understand things that we never understood. He Hakavona. This is what that Pasik means. Hamachshova Hanuis Vini Keras Mite Hamaisim Atzmon. Shemiyad Shi Oyu Ene Nu Bor Hadas Navina Mena Maisa Atzma. Or We're going to be able to understand the thought. We're going to get a beginning of the understanding of what thought process God had when he brought about certain events that to us looked like was chaos and our anarchy. We're going to get a beginning of a view. The eyes of the blind will become sighted. We're going to get an understanding of that inside that we were never able to see. We're going to have a new vision. Superman eyes. We're going to be able to see through walls. So what we can see through today, because there are walls blocking it, and that's all we see are the event, the anarchy, the chaos, and we can't see through the event. We get Superman eyes, and we can see through the event and inside the event. And then we begin to understand why that event was necessary to bring about the Gehula Shalem. There are certain things that are inside these events that are way too deep for even after our eyes become sighted for us to be able to understand from those events. Because there's a chachma that's the Ron Shalom's chachma is so great that you can't even understand from what he's done why he's done it. In other words, eventually we get Superman eyes, we look into the event, inside the event, and in the event we can understand why that event occurred. So, what are we looking at? We're looking at an event. And now I get to see inside the event, and I get to see why that event had to happen, and I understand that it was part of human history and it was a necessary part of human history. But there's so much chachma 
of the Rabbanu Shlolem that's not inside the event itself. It's completely external. It's part of the Chokhmah of the Rabbanu Shlolem on a much greater level. There we're never going to get to. So in other words, there's an event. That's all we see now is an event, and it seems chaotic. La'asid lavo, the Rabbanu Shlolem is going to give us x-ray vision. We're going to see inside the event, but we're still looking at the event. Inside the event, we're going to get a better understanding of why it had to happen and it was necessary for Gula Shlema. But there's much deeper thought than that. It's not just the thoughts that's in the event that I can see with my x-ray vision. There's much greater thoughts that are not even in the event, that are external to the event, would gone me completely. And that's a place that no one will ever get to. And this is all the, the purpose of the bonus law in doing all these things, whether we're going to understand it later or when even that higher level we won't understand. It's all to bring the imperfectly perfect world to a state of human perfection. Everything we're talking about now means at a human level. We're not talking about the godly level of perfection, the godly level of understanding. We're talking about Erkeno. As I've explained. We'll explain this sentence tomorrow. There's a very important footnote at the bottom of page 46 in our free lane, the sprint, footnote 16. It's a, it's, it's a really amazing footnote explaining the Ramchal sheet about what is the schar for Olam Haba? What exactly do you do la'asid lava? What do you do? Well, so we talk about there's something called nana mizif hashkena. What exactly the, can, do we, obviously nobody knows exactly what it is because no one has lived to see what nana mizif hashkena is. But are there any svarim? Do we have chazals that give us a bird's eye view a little? And what does this nenemi sefashpina mean? What is this great reward, la'asid lava, if a person lived his 70, 80, 90, whatever, I may have asked him shana life, and he lived a, a, a teoretic life, and he was moise nefesh, and he was basimcha to be moise nefesh, and he lived the way he's supposed to live, and la'asid lava, he's going to get nenemi sefashpina. What is this? Uh, is there anything that we have that can give us at least an inkling of what this Nenemi Zev Hashkina is? So Lineda will take a look at Rafi Landis footnote 16 about that tomorrow. And Lineda tomorrow we start at 10 and we will introduce a few minutes of a subject about beauty and the holiness of Eretz Yisrael as part of the Tik and Chet Hamaraglin during the three weeks, we should be zayich at the Nimesak and the Chet and the Bias Mashiach to Kenim Hev and Menu Kamei. All those Yid that need Yeshua, Shab Yeshua, all those Yid that need Shab Yeshua, all the Yid that need Nechama, Shab Nechama, all Yid that need specific kind of brachas should get those brachas from the Rabbi Nishloilam. All the brachas, Yeshua, Nechama, Shab Yeshua, only come from the Rabbi Nishloilam. He sends it through different people, he sends it through different ways, but ultimately he is the source, he's the Echad, Yachad, and Yuchad, it can come from nowhere else. We do our human effort for which he blesses the human effort. Otherwise, it's all up to Rabbi Nishlom, the Echad, Yachad, and Yuchad. And when we think about that, and we absorb that into our life, and we make that our attitude that is part of a Gilea that's part of perfecting our own imperfections and helping perfect the whole world. Everybody, please be careful. Given age considerations, health considerations, do the right thing. Stay away from places you shouldn't be going to. Uh, as I say, every day almost, the Rav loves healthy, happy Yidin who can learn Tamid, and learn about Brinda Korban, learn Dastagunas, learn about Eretz Yisrael. The Rav loves such Yidin as a mitzvah and a Torah to make sure a person remains healthy and well. And everybody should have a wonderful Gesundheit day. We'll pick up tomorrow morning. Thank you so much.